Good morning, Silicon Valley. I'm so happy to be here with you world-class entrepreneurs and scientists in the audience and across the country. We've been busy building the future and setting the global values for technology, like a freely shared internet, not controlled by any government. We have lofty ideas, and we believe in tough but fair competition. We also believed, until now, that we were on top of the world, confident that our open innovation culture would prevail. Well, I'm here to tell you that may not be the case. Your competitor isn't a company down the street here in Silicon Valley. It's a deeply strategic technology juggernaut, the Communist Party of China. Because China plays by different rules, our style of doing business and ability to set the values for technology may soon become much more limited. And it's happening faster than you think. It's time we acknowledge that China systematically extracts technology from the West through both legal and nefarious means. The stakes are enormous, but the news isn't all bad. All of us here can affect how this comes out. Instead of closing our system, as we're already beginning to do, we can and must compete. And then in some cases, we can even cooperate. So let's discuss, first, how China is reaching its goal to be number one in most key technologies. Second, where that leaves us. Third, what the US and the West have done about it to date. And fourth, what we must all now do together. One example of how China acquires cutting-edge tech sounds like a good spy novel. Su Bin, a Chinese national, owned a small aviation firm in Canada. He was a renowned expert. What no one knew was that he was also one of China's most valuable spies. Su was the key to an enormous hacking operation. He was what's called a spotter. He would lead Chinese government hackers to the most interesting engineers and leaders inside Boeing and other US aerospace firms. With Su's help, they then stole hundreds of thousands of files related to the C-17 military transport plane. It paid off. Here's the US C-17 cargo plane. It cost $31 billion and years of engineering effort to create. The Chinese hacking operation, by contrast, cost just a million dollars. And the outcome was this. Notice anything? This is the Xi'an Y-20 cargo plane. Doesn't it look a lot like its US counterpart? Now, let me be clear. Not all Chinese steal technology. Many are first-rate innovators in their own right. But the politics and values of the Chinese Communist Party are not like ours. It's a top-down authoritarian system. This is President Xi Jinping, and what he says goes. When was the last time you saw our president in front of our Congress getting this kind of applause? <laughs> <laughs> president Xi has been very public and intentional about China's goals. By 2025, China wants to master and produce at home key technologies like semiconductors, self-driving cars, 5G, and others. By 2035, it wants to be a global leader in innovation in all key technologies. And by the middle of this century, China wants to lead in national strength and influence with an army that can fight and win. How is China reaching these goals? There's nothing wrong with China wanting to rise. Nothing wrong with wanting to innovate, but China often doesn't play fair. Our Western innovation system is based on private enterprise, unguarded universities, and open source research. Not so China's. In the past few years, the world has woken up to China's effort to vacuum up the world's technologies. It's a systematic effort coordinated by the Communist Party, and this is how it works. First, through cyber spying and stealing trade secrets, like Su Bin did, which one commission estimates cost the US economy between 200 and 500 billion dollars every single year. Second, 
by encouraging students at Western universities, Chinese students at Western universities to spy. This does not mean that all Chinese students are spies, far from it, but increasingly they're getting pressure from their government to do so. Third, by investing in some of our most advanced technology companies. In recent years, Chinese have been involved in 10 to 15 percent of all U.S. venture deals. And finally, by forcing Western companies to hand over intellectual property as the price of doing business in China. Now, China also has a very impressive, entirely legal, whole of government effort to educate its scientists, to provide lots of funding for key technologies like semiconductors and AI, and then, because the Chinese Communist Party has such a tight grip on its private sector, to ensure that anything learned in a private lab goes to benefit the Chinese government and military. Through all these means, China is rapidly catching up. Depressed yet? I don't mean to terrify you. I love China. I wrote a book about it. I travel there all the time. I have many friends there. This is not about the Chinese people. But it's time that we connect the dots on what the Communist Party of China is trying to do. They haven't surpassed us yet, but when we look in the rearview mirror, those objects are closer than they appear. Where does this leave the U.S.? We used to pour generous funding into the toughest technologies, but no longer. In recent years, of all the global money going into AI startups, almost 50% went to Chinese startups, just 38% to the U.S., and far less to the rest of the world. We used to give our students a world-class science and technology education, but no longer. A recent OECD study ranks China 10th in the world in science and math scores, and the U.S. a measly 31st. That's unacceptable. We used to collaborate effectively between the private and public sector, but no longer. Numbers are hard to compare, but in recent years, the Chinese government has vastly increased its research and development funding, so it now spends nearly 9% of its budget. The U.S. spends less than 3%. Compare that to the space age in the 1960s, where we spent nearly 12 percent. And finally, we used to set the global values and standards for technology, but no longer. Huawei, a Chinese company, is set to dominate the 5G infrastructure, the antennas and routers that are going to run everything from your mobile phone to the whole Internet of Things. We shouldn't want any one company Chinese or not, to have the ability to shut down our electricity grid, or if they want, make all the self-driving cars veer off the road. There is no good outcome to the path we're on. If we do nothing, here's where we end up. We could see, for example, the spread of China's Orwellian social control system to other countries where they're using face recognition and monitoring what people say online to stop jaywalking, sure, but also to make sure that no one's saying anything negative about their government. China's already using this to oppress their own Uyghur minority, and they're exporting that technology to dictators around the world. We could see dangerous gene editing experiments on humans if we don't work together to set the ethics for this type of research. You already saw a Chinese scientist come out with a, quote, AIDS-proof baby late last year. And, most importantly, we could see violent conflict increase because we haven't bothered to set the norms for cyber war, like we saw in our 2016 election, or robots in war. And as China and others increasingly adapt these technologies and their international ambitions grow. This is not inevitable. It's in our power, all of us, to choose a different future. The Chinese aren't 10 feet tall. They have a long way to go, and we can compete effectively if we get started now. So what have we done to date? It's been almost entirely defensive. 
So far, the U.S. government has pulled up the drawbridge to Castle USA, dug a moat, and tried to protect the technology that's inside. We recently tightened up our laws to make it harder for Chinese and other foreigners to invest in our technology companies, and we're in the process of broadening our export controls so U.S. companies can't sell cutting-edge technology to China. This alone isn't going to solve the problem. Moats and walls won't work. Technology is airborne. Much of it has already flown. As all of you know, we're part of one global web of innovation. Let me give you an example. Semiconductors, often designed in the U.S., but then you manufactured in South Korea, in Japan, and in Taiwan. From there, they move to China, where they're assembled into all the gadgets in your pocket. And from there, they're sold all over the world. Tech companies collaborate across borders and innovate everywhere. Alibaba, a Chinese company, does much of its AI research in China, but also in the US, in Moscow, in Israel, in Singapore, and elsewhere. Google has advanced research labs here, but also in China, in London, in India, and around the world. Breaking up this global web will be nearly impossible. Most countries won't go along and would punish us as much as China. So what would a positive offensive strategy look like? To compete, we do not have to declare the Chinese people the enemy, and we do not have to close ourselves off from the world. Here's how we, all of us working together, including you, could do it. On the global level, we have to stop going it alone. After World War II, a remarkable group of people came together and created the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and the IAEA that governs nuclear power. It was an enormous effort, and it paid off. Well, it's time for another such effort. We could create, for example, a Tech 10 group of like-minded countries, including Israel, India, Japan, and others, that would meet regularly to set the global values and standards for technology, to make sure that AI doesn't invade your privacy and that there are norms to govern cyber war. China wouldn't be excluded from this. It would just have to accept the same high standards. We also made to, need to make sure that trade in technology is fair with our allies, not alone, as we're currently doing. There should be costs to countries like China who steal and extort to get an unfair advantage. The U.S. government should get into the act. We absolutely must increase our federal R&D budget by billions of dollars every year. Currently, our government and military are hopelessly dependent on the private sector. We also must ensure that there's much more competence in the U.S. government about technology. Did you all see the Zuckerberg hearings last year? I was left feeling that many of our members of Congress are terrifyingly unprepared to govern advanced tech. Time to change that. We must improve our science and technology education. We just can't be the engine of progress if our children can't do math. And on immigration, rather than banning Chinese scientists from studying here and keeping the best minds out of the US, we should let them in vet people carefully, and crack down hard on anyone who is actually caught spying. Xenophobia is not the answer. It's not just governments. All of us, including all of you here and watching online, have a role to play. If you work in a private sector tech company or a university, wake up. A cyber threat from China or elsewhere is probably already within your system. This is not the U.S. government just being paranoid. And please, within reason, begin cooperating with your own government again. All of the legendary Silicon Valley companies, Fairchild Semiconductor, Varian, and others did this. Contrast that with Project Maven, where last year Google and the Pentagon had a huge blow up over working together on a pretty basic AI project, and Google ultimately pulled out. Within reason, 
we must become patriots again, rather than just fixating on becoming unicorns. Together, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Together, we can bend history. And if we create a level playing field, we can even cooperate with China on tech that helps all of us. Solar, wind, biotech, things that help all humans. We're a magnanimous people with big ideas. We're being called on now to make a once in a generation effort to steer technology in the right direction. Let's get started.